Welcome to the Mindful Millennial Podcast, where host Seth Marcus dissects and discusses all things impacting the millennial mind. Mentors, peers, and professionals share intimate conversations on subjects such as entrepreneurship, exercise, and health, the blessings and curses of technology, travel, and how to navigate adulthood in this age of information. We're the largest generation in history, and we dictate the future. The Mindful Millennial finds a signal through the noise. <clears throat> Smelly cat. Smelly cat. Oh. I went out one time in Barcelona and immediately got a sore throat. Anyway, here it goes. Hey everyone, welcome to the Mind Mill and my first international episode. I've been in Spain for nearly two months now and I wanted to release an episode I recorded here before moving on to other countries. This last week I've been in Barcelona, exploring the city, meeting fellow travelers, and filling my hard drive with photos of amazing architecture. The city and culture absolutely live up to its reputation. It's going to be hard to leave. My next stop is Morocco, which I'm sure will be yet another adventure. Camel rides, blue cities, and the best markets in the world are coming up. I'll be sure to keep you all posted. Today we are with Kerwin Hawkins and Elena Moreno Barbero. Kerwin and Elena were some of the first friends I met when I moved to Denver almost nine years ago. Yet they moved back to Almeria, Elena's hometown, to raise their newborn twins in the Spanish culture within a few months of my arrival. I was sad to see them go, but almost a decade later, I'm here in their country, sharing a firsthand experience in the culture of Andalusia. Kerwin and Elena founded and run Anglophone English Academy, which is now in two large locations in Almeria, Spain, and teaches hundreds of students. They also actively employ travelers and locals alike to create a rich and diverse faculty. They did all of this while moving across the world and raising their three children. They are and have been a huge inspiration to me as to how one can live and raise a family anywhere in the world. Chatting with Kerwin and Elena is easy. They love to laugh and hearing their story in detail was a true pleasure. In this interview, we discuss the differences in US and Spanish culture, raising a bilingual family, starting a business as husband and wife and with young children, and how American work ethic can both help and hurt entrepreneurs abroad. This episode flew by for me. I can only hope we do a part two down the line, wherever that may be. I hope you enjoy this Mind Mill episode with Kerwin Hawkins and Elena Moreno Barbero. Let's play the intro music, all right? Let's get this going. There's there is no intro music. <laughs> well, how, how do we know when the show starts? <laughs> I'll put that in. <laughs> Oh, wait, that's the A-Team. It's okay. We'll use it for Chicken this, too. singing the A-Team. I think the rights have expired on the A-Team keep, music. Keep going now. under control. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Are we live? Maybe. Awesome. Maybe. That's good. It's important to be live. Well, Kerwin, Elena, welcome <laughs> to the Mindful Millennial Podcast. How are you guys doing today? We're good, or I'm good. Yeah. yeah. I'm, Super I'm good. excited. Good. Thanks, thanks for having us, Seth. Yeah. We're here at Anglophone in Almeria, Spain. Mm-hmm. And I am so excited you guys gave me 10 minutes of your time, right? <laughs> if we got a 10-minute window that I've already blown past just in trying to get this thing set up. 10 minutes is good. All right. <laughs> well, no, thank no, you guys we'll, so we'll much for stopping by. Times and if necessary. You got 10 minutes as many times as you need. Oh, okay. <laughs> Great. We'll just start over. Yep. Let's start. Yeah, I'm sure. Why not? In 10 minutes, I'll start the interview. As over long again. as you set up that cool A-team chicken singing <laughs> theme song. <laughs> <laughs> that's what i want to don't hear. tempt me carolyn i'm, sure. we I'm a musician it. and i'm i'll do anything for <laughs> but, you know as long as it's got a bitch and bass line i'm sure it'll be good <laughs> all right that's about as good of an opener as any of them but i was thinking of like how do i start an interview in spain and i thought the best way was like well maybe i'll say something really great in Spanish and show everybody that I've been learning. And then I was like, but I'm still shit at Spanish. And I was talking to our mutual friends and they reminded me of Elena's trouble with her own English speaking when she was living That's in an America. Ambush. This is a linguistic ambush. <laughs> Continue, please. This was about you, said. Tell me. <laughs> she told me a number of different funny ones, but the one that I liked was when you explained how you were crying your balls out. <laughs> <laughs> so, I you, still have to one? think every time that I'm going to say that expression because it's when what you're about comes to cry. out of my mouth. I want to cry my balls out. I don't even know what's the right one. How do you say you that correctly? You can cry your eyes out. Oh, okay. laugh it. <laughs> you can laugh your ass off. No, no, no. What it is is it's bawling your eyes out. <laughs> oh, there you go. That, I can see how That's that would it. be confusing. That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
these are called phrasal verbs. Most Americans and English speakers, native English speakers, don't understand what those are, but it's anytime you take a verb and you add a preposition to it. Okay. So you could spice up, fall out, all the things that we put mm -hmm. together where we don't have a specific verb for it. We take get a up, verb get and down. We add a, yeah, mm -hmm. get up, get down. Tonight. So and none of it, none confused. of it really makes that much sense. No, unless sense. you are a native English speaker, and then you use them all the time. Right. So I've noticed that a lot in trying to communicate with the Spanish people. Is even when they're good with English, as soon as I say any phrase, right. I just get fogged. <laughs> but I'm definitely on the losing side of that because yeah. Elena will speak very politely and slowly with me, and then I'll hear her talk with her sister, and I can't pick up any of it. <laughs> <laughs> There's such a vulnerability when you're learning a language, but it's so, looking back, it's such a cool process to go through because you're showing your truer, more, what's the word that I'm looking for? Like very, you're very new and there's like, you don't have all your chit chat, like all the things that you use every day with your language. So you feel like so exposed and so vulnerable, but it's a, such a cool process to be building up from that. I think that was, you're going through it right now. Okay, we had to go through it when we came here. I had to do it when I was living there. And looking back, I think it's a really, really cool experience to go through that process of learning a language. It's really fun looking back. Yeah, you're in a vulnerable state, and it helps you to understand the empathy that you need for other people who are not speaking your native language or trying to learn your native language. No question. Yeah. The hardest part for me is I do a podcast. I love good conversation and I feel that I am bringing such baseline conversation to someone who speaks Spanish when I'm trying to speak very slowly and very basic. And it's more of just me using the words I know rather than getting into some sort of connection right. and some sort of connective dialogue. Right. And that, that can be deterring for any young speaker of a new language to right. even want to try to the feeling that you're boring the other person right. right well but it also makes you think about all the other resources you have you know your corporal expression your the way that you look your hands that we in spain use probably more than you do there but you realize that there's in communication there's all these other things that we could be using because Kevin and i when we met i didn't speak much english and you didn't speak that much my Spanish um, was perfect when we <laughs> So I had carried a dictionary around just to make people think that I didn't understand what they were saying. <laughs> I was playing possum. So you could get out of get out of conversations that you Absolutely. were bored by. Absolutely. Yeah, then I was in control. I just sandbagged. I played <laughs> possum. I played possum and I sandbagged. Sad so maybe my Wait, so you just acted yeah. like you were asleep? Is that what you mean by yeah, pretty possum? much, pretty much. I acted like I was dead. <laughs> <laughs> just fall asleep in conversation <laughs> until they walked away. It worked. It worked. <laughs> I have a small idea, but would you guys tell me how you guys ended up meeting? Meeting? Yeah, for the first time, especially with the language barrier. Yeah. We were in Granada, which is an awesome place. You've been there already. Mm. And we had a... I was just thinking about how when I, when I first got to Granada, everyone, if you... Because these are pre-Tinder days, obviously. If you wanted to meet people from, <laughs> from other countries, that was really kind of the key. So you would put up a sign in the language center that was a intercambio which would be a language exchange and you someone would call you and then you would go on you would meet and you speak a half an hour in english or half an hour in spanish so that was kind of the way people met each other to some degree there but ours was a little different case so. yeah it was like kerwin found a roommate and that roommate of his that was american too had a girlfriend that was a classmate of mine and there they became a couple and they're living together in the states my friends was like, oh, let's meet JJ's new roommate. And there was Kerwin. And he was like, he was a lucky guy because it was like... Eight. It was a great day. It was a great day because my roommate JJ had said, all right, you need to meet some Spanish girls. So we're going to have a party on Saturday. I'm like, oh, great, dude. I happen to like parties, so that was okay with me. And the doorbell rang and nine girls showed up. So in Spain, you give two kisses to a girl when you meet them. So it was 18 kisses later. I was like, that. just the probability, the odds here have to work out for me one way or the other. <laughs> but no, we had a great day. And I think we, lunch turned into, here in Spain, it's not uncommon that when people go out at lunch, they end up coming home at seven in the morning. So it bleeds that into was, that. Yeah, it bleeds into the night and into the morning. So I think we went out for lunch or we had lunch and then had drinks and then we went out for tapas in the evening. And then I got home at 7 a.m. or something that mm -hmm. next day. So yeah. and then we started dating right after that yeah so. was this your first trip to europe when you guys met in granada that was my second trip 
I okay. had done a summer after my first year in college. I had saved up some money, so I traveled around for seven weeks by myself, juggling and street performing and soaking up culture. So it was a good seven weeks. How did you budget your street performing income with the traveling lifestyle? Where I mean, were you going hungry? Or were you spending it more on booze than food? What was well? That's kind of a funny assumption. You must know me pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> it's like we've gone out for tapas before. <laughs> exactly. I had seven weeks. I, I didn't have much money, but I had like seven days of travel. I was on a pretty bare bones deal. Some places I could make money juggling. Some places I couldn't. I mean, I ended up meeting some very interesting people. Got hired by some go-go dancers to juggle fire on the night of San Juan in a disco. There's like a thousand people below me and I'm on a catwalk juggling at five o'clock, six o'clock and seven o'clock in the morning when I had to juggle. <laughs> so you can imagine the state of the juggler by the time my five o'clock, six o'clock and seven o'clock rolled around. I threw one torch <laughs> into the say, crowd of a thousand yeah. people. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but it wasn't a big deal. Everybody seemed to be okay with it. But in the Ponte Vecchio, when I was in Florence, I would make, you know, $50 a day or so and work for 40 minutes. But I had to work every day because I didn't have that much money. So I would juggle fire every day, every day. So at the end of seven weeks, my hands, I was an extremely good juggler. My hands were quite scarred from the fire juggling for seven weeks. But it was a great trip. I got to see a lot of places and eat a lot of good food. And it was an excellent thing. But at that point, I met a person when I was in the Costa Brava in Barcelona. And I was at 11 o'clock in the morning, I was having coffee. And this friend of mine was having beers with his friend and her bumper had been stolen off her car, which I thought was quite strange. His words were, my name's Oriol, uh, you come party two days, no need money. So I'm like, all right, well, this sounds like obviously my kind of guy. It's like the limit so, of his English too. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> so they had a family get together. It was about 40 people and it was just two days of eating, drinking and hanging out by the beach. And uh, after that, I thought, well, this is probably a country that I could come and hang out in. So I made up my mind and I wanted to come back to Spain and study. And I had the opportunity three years later to come to Spain and to study in Granada. And I had never been to Southern Spain. So I was quite excited about that. And I came and fell in love and here I am. 18 years later, 19, no, there'll be 20 years, 20 years since we've met in Chip. 28 days. How about that? That's crazy. So it's a much better date than Valentine's Day, the 28th <laughs> of February, Andalusia Day, the day we met. So 20 years, man. It's crazy. Wow. Yeah. I yeah. would ask if you guys have plans, but it seems like this just dawned on both of you. <laughs> <laughs> We're really bad with anniversaries and stuff yeah. like that, but... Is it the anniversary of when you met or the anniversary of when you That's got when married? we met. Then mm -hmm. we had like the wedding in, I think that's why, because we had like the wedding in the States, the visa wedding, then the wedding here, then the day that we met. So we just forget them all. Yeah. <laughs> and we celebrate every day. We celebrate every day. <laughs> oh, that's the right answer. And we dance like no one's watching. <laughs> and we <do. laughs> when your kids are watching. <laughs> yeah, they are. They obviously yeah, have picked up on your such moves. That's great answers, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's debatable. <laughs> so. At least they dance like they don't care. Exactly. Which is important. <laughs> so you met in Granada. What brought you guys back to the United States together? Mm -hmm. You know, it's hard to say. It was one of those things that we had been in the States for nine years. And I love it there, especially living in the Denver area, which is such an amazing place. I mean, we had such a good group of friends that I can call family. And the weather was great, you know, the city. But it was one of those things that... We were just a little too far because traveling from Denver to Spain, especially in the States where we actually had quite a bit of vacation, but we could never take more than two weeks straight. Oh yeah. That was hard. And it was like this realization, like if we're gonna have a family, where could they get more of both worlds? So we made the decision to come here. And I think that in that sense, now, since we've been here, we've been able to go to the States every summer or every other summer and spend a big chunk of time there. So I feel like it was a better compromise to get them exposure for the two cultures by living here than, don't you think, Kerwin, that, yeah. that we, I think that I miss the States, but I go there often. So, and you know, you're here in Almeria. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there's always like this bridge and connection still to the U.S. culture mm -hmm. and friends and family that don't make me I mean I still miss things about it but we don't go terribly long without being with our friends around or visiting or things like that so it was one of those things like if we don't do it now we won't do mm -hmm. it and I think that was probably it. we would have been there in Denver probably like super happy too mm -hmm. but with less access to the Spanish culture probably yeah 
that those seems... limitations that the states have, like vacation and long term. Mm -hmm. I've been thinking about this trip that I'm on right now is in a lot of ways trialing of where I'd like to live because I'm with you, Elena, where I don't want to live anywhere other than Denver mm -hmm. in, a, in America is, mm -hmm. the, is the, the, yeah. bit, the following statement. But where I would like to live in the world is very open. Mm -hmm. And so far, you know, being here, it's a very... It's very attractive. I love the culture, the, the time, the way people spend their time with others is, it's beautiful. I had thought that I could bring this culture back to America, but what your point of only having a certain amount of time that most jobs will let you take off is obviously a huge factor because now mm -hmm. you can, it's just kind of flipping it. Now mm -hmm. you can go back to the States and spend more time there. But if you were to live in the States, you wouldn't be able to do the same right. here in El Maria. Right. Yeah, unless that you do, I mean, you have your own business and you can do it. When we're there, we're part of big organizations that don't, didn't allow that. So here we also, by being having our own business too and being having that lifestyle that has worked out perfectly in that sense. No, we're also in a sector where we can take off an extended period of time. But in general, we could take up more time in the summer, but we take a similar amount of vacation as everybody else in that virtually the whole country takes the month of August off. And then at Christmas, we generally have two weeks and Easter vacation, we get a week. So it's similar to the any educational job, I think, in the States. But I think it's the way you alluded to the fact the way people spend their time here. I mean, people definitely spend the time during their day is organized in a different way. But everybody understands the importance of taking an extended period of time off especially in August. And that's something in the United States, so many people there don't take vacation and pride themselves on not taking vacation, et cetera, because we value different things. I think it's pretty easy. I think in the United States, we live to work. Lots of people here, I think, work to live, but I would say most of the people here live not to work. I think it's probably <laughs> closer to the truth, <laughs> so, which is all right, I think is a goal. Was it a, a shock for you as an American to come to Spain and have to kind of shed that live to work mentality or did you just not have that when you left? I think it took a significant amount of time to accept another culture and understand that it is what it is and I can't really affect any changes on, on how a whole culture has lived for thousands of years. I don't think that I can move mountains. At some point, you accept it. You begin to not fight it as much as the same bureaucratic processes are much more complicated here, much more frustrating. But over time, those things improve. I think everything in general in Spain is improving. I think it's difficult to have a country that is, was so homogenized after from 40 years in a dictatorship where everything was driven to be standardized on the part of, the, of Franco. I think it was to make every Spanish think, feel, act the same. So I don't think that Spanish people felt comfortable being different from the person next to them. And I think now they are beginning to be able to do that, which is something that I think is as a result of the economic crisis that had 45% unemployment in a country for four or five years. So people have begun to re-examine the way they live here. So I think things are changing here as well. So I don't know, it's just that I've accepted kind of the way their culture is or that their culture is also in a pretty significant time of change. There are many paradigms shifting in education, commerce. We're much more international than we were 15 years ago. More people are learning English, more people are traveling, more people are understanding that we have to adapt in the next generation to different needs if we want to prepare our children and to really guarantee being able to be competitive. So hmm. it was quite the tangent. But. It makes a lot of sense. And I, I love hearing your guys' opinions of this as somebody who's about to go see what the French culture is like and then maybe right. Italy or go up into, <clears throat> into the Netherlands, places like that, and see the differences of different areas of just Europe alone, not to mention everywhere in the world. Elena, coming from Almeria, did you experience kind of an inverted culture shock going to America? I was also in a time coming out of college that you were just so excited and have all this energy and wanted to do things. And, and it is true that in the States, I really found that if you work hard and you are put your energy into something, it really works. I mean, that thing about the American dream and where really you can try to achieve your dreams and make it happen. It is true, or at least for me, I really felt that there was always 
coming there as a nobody young person to a new place with my English was not good at the time. People were really nice and there was opportunity. So I had an amazing experience there and it was definitely a shock, but I didn't realize until years later. I mean, because the stuff that's different about the States probably in terms of work culture and stuff like, and things like that. I mean, I didn't realize probably until the end or in my last years there where I realized that, wow, there's, you know, what you do and, you know, making the possibility that all your dreams can become true can also fall into like this ambition or like you realize that big part of your life is devoted to that, you know, it becomes a religion too and can be dangerous. And I probably didn't realize also that until I came back here and looked at it from the, as an outsider, mm -hmm. because there, especially working for a big corporation, you're so part into that world in every direction is bringing you messages, you know, like if you do this, you can do that and you're feeling good, you're feeling realized in the workplace and that could have the double-edged sword of being like, okay, this cannot take this big percentage of my life kind of be surrounded by that, but there's also big motivation to achieve things. It's a very do type of culture, which I love because I feel also like I like to have goals and, you know, and be always thinking about that. But I do feel sometimes like you can get trapped into that. And I didn't notice that until I was here, but that's like maybe like a small, it's not even a criticism. It's like a little bit different ways of thinking and perspective mm -hmm. on, on things. But that's why the state, so many things work so great there because, you know, it really promotes that type of culture and thinking. And it's a really amazing place to develop yourself professionally. So... That was different, but again, a lot of things that I still miss and a lot of, I still have a lot of always great things to talk about the country. And I, and I love when I have Spanish friends going there that the first thing that everybody says, like, people are just so friendly. And it is true. I mean, there's something about it. I'm not, I don't know if you'll notice that in Europe where people are also very friendly too, but the Americans also, also so welcoming. I think that's also from, in a way, I think that Denver is also isolated, maybe not so much anymore, but mm -hmm. you know, when there's, to me as a foreigner coming there, I always felt that people were always very curious. They wanted to know how living in Spain was like, they always had questions, you know, so. Did you experience that in Denver specifically or in the other places that you visited in America? Other places too. I think that it just in, in Denver, I just happened to spend more time and observe more of that culture. But yeah, I would say like even in... I think people are open about asking questions yeah. in the States too. You know, yeah. they would say, how long have you been in the States? Where are you from? Yeah. What's it like? Do you like right. it here? I think people are free to be inquisitive there. Yeah. Here, I don't think people quickly ask you questions yeah. about who you are the same way in the States. In the States, people are pretty open conversationalists with strangers, maybe yeah. more so than here in some ways. What's... About, about questions of depth, anyway. I'm very new to Spanish culture. How would uh, an initial meeting of a person go in Spain as different to the friendly question asking as I'm sitting yeah. here asking you questions as right. an American. <laughs> I would say like one thing that in the States will come up probably in a second and third question. Let me know what you think. Sure. But I think it's like, it's like, hi, where are you from? What do you do? Mm -hmm. Right. That comes probably third. Sure. That would never come up in the first five or six questions or 15th, that you or that's a very question. personal thing here like what <clears> you do is not as important and it's not defining of who you are it comes later we can agree if it's defining or not but if for some reason it's more like a personal question than it will be in the states i, I just think, think it's of less interest to people yeah. generally work <laughs> because most people don't want to talk about their work here <laughs> I don't, very rarely mm, do they work they work say, to live i like that or mm. they it just doesn't come live up to that not much work. because yeah people i think the first 10 questions somebody might let's suppose you're sitting on a plane and i think that's a pretty universal place where we can all relate to and i think in the united states if you sit next to somebody you start a conversation those are the first three or four questions that you get. Here, I think they'd ask you about almost everything but your job. And even in an hour conversation, that might not even come up. So you might talk about, there's just so much more value placed on other things. They talk we about... We measure ourselves so greatly in the United States by what our monetary contribution or what our value is. We tie our personal value very tightly to our vocation and our personal worth. I think we place great importance on that. So... So I guess what would be the third question in a, a Spanish interaction with, with a new person is would you talk about your clothes, talk about the news, <laughs> talk about Can I answer know, the, yeah, the weather. Yeah. I mean, Go for it. What I find in most of the conversations when people find out I'm from somewhere else, 
the pride about what we have here is probably the third question is something that requires an affirmation. Something like, I'll bet the weather where you're from isn't as nice as it is here. <laughs> I'll bet you don't have beaches <laughs> like this, do you? <laughs> and if, if you're in a taxi, it never fails. You're like, you don't have good looking women like that, do you? And that's funny. <laughs> taxi drivers, that's their favorite way to talk during when you go for a ride. But if you're riding alone, that's one of the things they talk about. Because I think Spanish people in general are very proud of what they have because elsewhere in Europe, maybe there's only one other country, two other countries, Mediterranean countries, Italy and Greece, that have beautiful weather, a slower moving culture, heavy emphasis on family, clear communication in some ways. People may not be super polite as they are in, in Protestant northern countries, but people here, I would say, are they say what they need to say initially. If they need to react strongly, they do, and then they get over it. I've had discussions, which in the United States, driving my car, where a guy on a motorcycle had to tell me I couldn't do something. We pulled up to a stoplight, and I rolled down my window, and we had a conversation. In the United States, some, we would have had a fight. So it's funny how here we can have those conversations <laughs> that don't end in violence, and it's not a big deal. But in the United States, for some reason, that turns into something completely different. So I'm taking this in a completely different direction. <laughs> so what happens when you give me a microphone. <laughs> That's interesting. I found that the more I focus on my own presence in America and I have a distaste for talking about jobs and what you do, especially money, that's just bad taste pretty much anywhere you go. I find that the less confrontational that you are, the more you're likely to attract people who are also less confrontational or the more genuine you are in conversation, the less tolerance you have for more of like a bullshit conversation or something that's very surface level and it's easier to identify that and dive further into something more meaningful something that will facilitate a better connection with the people do you find that it's easy to create very close connections with the spanish or are they a bit more guarded until a year passes or that's a good question it's hard to say i think that also here because the sense of community you know, a lot of people that are born, are, they live in the same place that are born. That in the States, it's hard to find. People are constantly moving. That mm -hmm. sometimes makes it hard to build communities when it's like so easy to move there to here's much harder. You cannot get your electricity bill and your internet as fast as you do there, I think. But I think is that because of that, people tend to have family and friends from years and stuff like that so not all the time are seeking it's not that they're not seeking new friendships but maybe it's not like when you move to a new place that you really want to establish that right away and and i feel like in the states you always have people that are constantly moving and setting trying to set up their community where they're going here i think that people have been living in the same place for many years so they have that more established so it's not like they don't want to they're not that interested in opening up is that they may not have that necessity it's harder for me as a, as a spanish person to maybe inspect or reflect on that as an outsider but you're still gonna find i don't think that they're gonna be more less friendly or anything like that it's just it's going to take more time because it's not they may already have plans with their family to have lunch at their mothers on sundays and stuff like that it's my impression that that people don't tend to move it's not for some reason the i mean obviously there's spanish people that go abroad and live abroad like i did most of them tend to come back weirdly enough they spend time abroad and then they tend to come back close to where they live or if not to the same town, which I don't think in the States that's that common for some reason, or maybe depends where you're from, I suppose. Well, I think in the States, the transience of the population is a big deal because economically, if you have an opportunity, generally people choose to go somewhere else to make more money, to further their career, do whatever. Here, most people tend to try to get closer to their family. Like Elena was saying, a lot of people will move away because the job opportunities, particularly in Almeria for recently graduated people, is they're not a lot of opportunity. So people go abroad or they go somewhere else and they work on their resume. When it's better, they come back. Or when it's time for them to have kids, a lot of them do come back. But we do have a lot of neighbors who are from different places in Spain. Yeah. And they tend to form friendships quite easily here too. But friendships are require certain things. And one of those is time. And if you have time, you will cultivate friendships. If you do not have time, you will not cultivate friendships. You will either rely on the ones you had or the ones you have will be of less 
compromise or, or less commitment time-wise and emotionally. Because if you're raising children and you have your own business, then you certainly have less time to do those things. If you don't have children and you have more time, then you can spend more time eating out with other friends and spending lots of time. And also the third component is the strong family connection here. Most everybody eats one or more meals with their family, extended family, a week. Almost everybody on Sunday is having lunch with their family. So I think that reduces the amount of time you have to spend with other people and cultivate those possible friendships. But there are always people who are willing to form friendships with you anywhere if you have the time to cultivate that friendship. I don't think it's difficult anywhere. If no, you... in fact, that that's something like one of the struggles I feel lately, like there's so many people that I want to get to know more is just finding the time, you know, you're like, I really like this person. We need to find time to get through like experiences and, and get to know them better. But yeah, in the end, you kind of have to decide how you organize it. So those things tend to sometimes you make them a priority and if not, they well, and I would say the Spanish back. schedule, I think, in some ways limits your ability to have that time because here everyone works from nine to two. They come home for two hours. They go back to work from four to six thirty or seven. So we don't have the long evenings that you have in the United States where you may join an activity or or you go most of the time the people that we end up talking to are people who are have children who are the same age as ours or they're in the same activities. It's really you have to have just consistent contact or time with those people during the week there's not a lot of time in the evenings to really talk with other people well so. but at the same time at least in Almeria because it's a small place you're socializing all day long you walk into the store and you run into people that you know you go into the street and you run you go to have a coffee or a break and so at the same time you don't have the feeling that at the end of the day it's like I think I've got my social time already you know <laughs> you to go home with, without, making yeah, any plans. Without, being, yeah. without making any plans so sometimes right. it goes like that because I'm like oh you know I feel like I got to talk to this person and that person and so that's it it comes out easily because it's not everything is very the way that the cities are built there's not that sprawl those big sprawls mm -hmm. that require you to drive and so it's right. densely populated it's easy to go from A to B mm -hmm. and it doesn't have that different that's a different most of the Spanish cities compared to other cities in the states like the Denver area where you have that sprawl have to take traffic into account when you mm -hmm. move that's something that for the things that I love that's something that I certainly I don't miss that. yeah just being spending so much time in the car that's why podcasts aren't that popular here because nobody's ever in the, car. <laughs> in the United States I spent half my day in my car a... well I'll tell you I switched to spoken word while I ride my bike I ride my bike everywhere here in oh, Almeria and I've been just digesting books on tape I've actually taken a break from listening to podcasts not that <laughs> You guys should. You guys should all listen yeah. to more podcasts. Obviously, obviously. Well, that's a, you got a new me into phenomenon them. here as well. Podcasts, I think, the only time I hear people really doing much with podcasts here is for language learning. And there are lots of language learners that are listening to English podcasts for that as well. But I'm sure as everything takes an extra two years to get here, I'm sure that the more widely listened to podcasts will be here soon. Mm -hmm. they, I want to tell an anecdote, really, that I found interesting when we moved to Almeria. The people here, when they see someone, because it's so densely populated, you see people you know every morning, every afternoon, everywhere you walk, you see people. But instead of saying hello, they say goodbye. So instead of saying <laughs> hello, if I see somebody, they say hasta luego, which means also that I don't have time to talk to you. It's, if someone says hello... <laughs> they say see you later they, before yeah. they even yeah. say hello. Yeah. If they say, they say goodbye then that means oh, they don't have time to talk. So they say, <laughs> hasta luego. So that just means I, I see you, I acknowledge you, but I don't have time to stop and talk. It took me a long time, and I still have a hard time, but I can't, it doesn't come out of me to say goodbye when I see people. So they're saying goodbye, and I'm saying hello, so they're kind of, it catches them in mid-step, and they don't know if they think that I want to talk or they don't want to talk. I think it's time to <laughs> adopt like an aloha sort of <laughs> phrase in Spain, where it's just like... Sure. I see you. Hello and goodbye. <laughs> you see me. I acknowledge there you. There you go. <laughs> sure, sure. We're like the Italians. Or just say, say adio, prego, just say prego, adios. Just say adios before you prego, prego, Maybe we prego, just say. Prego. Prego. Well, That's I need true. to. I need to the learn Italians learn these fixed. new these new phrases because as soon as I I feel like I've gotten five percent fluent in Spanish, I'm leaving and going to another country <laughs> where I know Well, nothing. the good thing is you need to come back and spend more time. Hey, man, if I can get this visa extended, I will be back. I'll be back in the spring and cool. I will be, and I'll, I'll go down to Canaries and Morocco and do a springtime. Oh, cool. That would be 
just absolutely a dream. You're going to have so many stories. That's crazy. And comparing, you know, your experience in all these countries and stuff like that. It's going to be awesome. I'm looking forward to all these different destinations I'm going to, but having a home base here for the first six weeks of this trip have been just unbelievable as far as the support, seeing you guys, seeing my family, my hosts have been awesome. Just a city that you can ride your bike anywhere to is just beautiful, which I think is why I'm leaning more towards staying in the South yeah. where the weather will, will allow that. I think in Munich right now, I would want to walk from my room to the nearest cafe and then immediately back or something like that. Right? I think people there adjust in Munich, especially they're riding bikes all over the city in cold weather too. I, mm -hmm. I don't think that you can keep those people inside yeah. during mm -hmm. that time either. But generally our winter is over. We had about two weeks of winter. <laughs> and it, uh, it ended two days ago. So because today it's I'm glad I got to experience 70, winter here. 70 degrees, and it got down into the 40s for about two weeks, and that's the end of winter. So it's a good thing. Do you find yourself sticking to Fahrenheit or is it flirting between the two? Well, I go back and forth, but the real meaning of warmth and cold to me is still Fahrenheit, just the same way as golf is in yards. And mm -hmm. the only thing I'm really happy to get rid of, I think, is weight and volume and liquid. It doesn't make sense. Yeah, because ounces. density is one kilogram per liter, sure. guys. Well, and think, and think about it's it. It's easy. As, I mean, if you sell marijuana, it should be in, in that as well, because I think about 28 grams in an ounce and a quarter of that and this and that. So if you think about it, that's a lot, a lot of math for somebody who's for stoners. smoking weed. To do. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It was hard for me back in the day. It must be hard for everybody else today. But uh, math. Well, guys, we're sitting here in Anglophone, the company that you guys built, what, a few weeks into moving back to Almeria. I wanted to ask you guys about that critical time of the big decision to leave America, raise your family back here in Almeria, and then being faced with starting a new business with twins, with newborn twins. It's so intimidating to start a business when you're a parent, but to have newborns and to be freshly moved to a new country. Can you guys expand a little bit on that experience? Mm -hmm. We didn't plan it. It just happened. Like we thought that I was going to be able to rely on my job in the States, letting me work from here, but that didn't work out in the long term. And at some point we were contemplating maybe moving to Paris so I can continue my job there. And, and I remember being there. My kids were a few months old. We didn't want to start up in a new place right then. We were like, we're great in Colorado. We either moved to Spain or we go back. And at the time we were already here and we, we just were looking at, I think that at the time it was just a matter of necessity. What can we do really to make this happen? We always had the idea that it was going to be, this move was going to be reversible. Like if this doesn't work, we can always go back. At the time, Kerwin started doing some English classes. Well, we both continued to work for, I worked for three months for the company. I was in finance in the States and I continued to work with them for three months. And then I took about six months off because Elena continued to work with her company. So yeah, Kerwin was the stay at home dad. Yeah, um, for a while it was a great period as well. But then as uh, when Elena finished her work, I started teaching uh, a friend of mine helped me kind of get a few of the basic ideas of how to organize my time, what to charge people, et cetera. And I began to teach private classes and I would hop on my bicycle and ride all over the city. And as Elena began a consulting firm sometime after that, it was a very difficult time in Spain with very high unemployment. It was very difficult to get paid when you did, when we did jobs, uh, and things like that. So the commercial billing, the, there was no liquidity. There was, it was a very, very rough time. I think people have quickly forgotten how difficult it was. Or At that point, I began to teach more and more classes. One time I was teaching maybe 40 hours a week or 42 hours a week of individual classes. And I would get on my bike at 8 o'clock in the morning and I would come home at 9 o'clock at night. And that was kind of the beginning of that. And through certain friends, we began to organize classes. And 2012 was the first year we actually taught classes. And we started out with 42 students renting a space in a nursery school in the afternoon. And by the end of that year, maybe we had 80 or 90 students. The following year, we had 250 students. And we moved into the space we're in now in March of 2014. And this will be our fourth complete year here. Yeah. And now we have this. Just, all those locations. things metamorphosized because originally Anglophone was going to be a digital platform. And it was. 
and it's kind of grown organically. There's probably 100 students and 10 teachers around the world teaching. So if anybody out there is interested in teaching English online, obviously get in touch with Seth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think that also, like, it's funny how now looking back, just trying to analyze all the other things that made this project happen. It was like all these things that were going on personally. Well, first, because Anglophone is that place, it's an immersion center where people learn English. We both had had the experiences of learning a language, so we all kind of knew. We have gone through the process to start, and we also had an idea of what would make that process a better experience for our students. We also had kids, and we were all very... We took time to study, read books, and figure out what was a good bilingual program for our kids, too. That's a gift that we could give our kids, you know, mm -hmm. to language from the get-go. So our family circumstances and that, you know, that going through that process, having kids, we had all these ideas. We were acquiring knowledge and how we want that experience to be for children, for adults. And then also bringing both of us our experience in the States in the different settings, because Karen was in finance and sales, and I was more in like engineering. So I'm, I think that all of that project planning and things like that, and all the skills that we had acquired over those years came at that point too. In a time in Spain where also that, it just happened to, the, there was a high demand for that, because I think in general, like just knowing languages, we want the future to be of um, kids that will be adults that are citizen of the world. That's how it is in education here right now. That's where we're moving to. So all those things just kind of happen without us even realizing. And we also had to make a living here. So mm -hmm. all those things came together. And I think that we, we were able to bring positive things of the, our experience in the American corporate culture to our business from different perspectives. And we never thought that we would work together, but it just kind of happened that way. And, it's, and I think it's been also very positive because we have we bring different things to the table. So it's like a, it's like a jambalaya of like all these different things that just happen. <laughs> jambalaya. Uh, <laughs> I did not expect that to be the descriptor. <laughs> Would you say that? Am no, I making one hungry, of those yeah, uh, yeah. words? No, no that, that works. I, I got it. I got it. I just didn't expect it. Jambalaya. just did not expect it. <laughs> yeah, but uh, it's definitely been a mix of different things. And the good thing is Elena and I are able to bring different qualities to the business different skills, and a lot of that was gained in the American corporate culture. But it's nice to take what works, take what's good, and uh, continue to think about the long-term vision of this company in that way. I was very comfortable and was able to develop in many, many ways in a merit-based American corporate culture that I think can allow people to really flower and turn into to well-developed professionals. I mean, I hope that as we continue to grow, uh, that we can be a company that is a blend of the good things that both of us found in, in that particular culture. Not everything about American corporate culture is evil. I think a lot of times uh, that we bash on it, but there's a reason that it's the greatest economy in the world. There are many things that you observe that the United States does right. The H-1 visa program where they capture talent like Elena from all over the world. You come and you study and they want to keep the best. So the ability to attract and keep talent is the key to any organization's success. And we're at that point right now that we've grown. And now there are people who we see who we want to take on leadership roles. And it's our job really is our roles change in this company to motivate people to become who they want to be. And a lot of times uh, young teachers don't see that there's a career here for them. But the ESL sector is changing a great deal. And people can look and say, all right, I, I don't want to manage people, but maybe I want to manage curriculum. Maybe I want to develop and coach and mentor teachers as a trainer in a training role. There are many different paths as we grow that are going to be interesting and fun to develop for the company there. But anyway, it's been, I think, Elaine is the yin to my yang. And I think the reason that all this has worked is because we complement each other so well. And the skills that I don't possess, Elena does. And we've managed to identify and find some wonderful, talented people who adopted our core values of community, creativity, positivity, and play, which are things that should always be key in making decisions in the educational sector. I think the one, the intangible is also how damn friendly you both are. 
and how, <laughs> just how how much I'm a damn how, friendly guy. Damn. How, how freaking great the vibe I've always got from you guys is. Um, Thanks, you know, so. you were some of the first people I met when I visited Denver, and then I, I was I was patio. sad <laughs> when I finally made my jump to Denver, and we right. had yeah. a month month and a half before mm-hmm. you guys left yeah, it was yeah. Right as yeah. We were leaving. but it's still surreal to see you guys here in your guys's home and see yeah. how how much everything has changed over the last few years i really respect your ability from coming from different backgrounds and different educations different personality types different job experiences to have the the open-minded mentality of taking the good and leaving the bad and Mm -hmm. keeping a positive outlook. And I think that that is something that is really crucial when you travel, something that can kind of get ingrained in your mind and in the advert and an adverse effect. If you never leave your hometown, then you don't feel the confidence of, or even the desire to meet a new person or to start something new or to experience a new culture. These are all things that you kind of create your bubble and you get really safe in that bubble. And I think that your guys's, experiences through life have led you to this this awesome period right now where we are so i commend you guys it's definitely you guys are role models for sure thank you thank you i want to express my gratitude to ann and mike one i want to applaud their their courage these are our friends ann and mike kaplan who decided to spend a year over here with us which is another reason why i sat this year i think they kind of broke some ground to come here and and i certainly would invite other people who are listening to the podcast try and spend a year with your family or by yourself living abroad because the only thing that can change the way you think so greatly is really living in another culture and spending your time a different way and looking at the world in a different manner i keep throwing this h1 visa thing out there when you have talent from different cultures that get together the problem that americans look at We look at it as Americans. When other people look at the same problem, they look at it as Indians or English people or French people. The future of education is going to be this collaborative use of knowledge. And I think that the sooner, the great thing about living in another country is we learn these interpersonal skills that help us to connect and talk with other cultures. So I certainly applaud Anne and Mike for their decision to bring their children over here and spend a year abroad because that is a life-changing event. And if you didn't get the opportunity when you're in college to go and spend a year in another country, there's no reason why you can't take a break in your career, organize yourself over two or three years in order to take that year and go somewhere else. Life is short. You'll never do it if you don't do it now. So whoever you are, get cracking and make it happen because there's nothing more rewarding, more insightful, and more full of joy and difficulty. Well, difficult and it will make you more empathetic and more, you know, aware of like nothing is black or white and that there's like the more you go through those experiences, the more you realize that you don't know as much as you thought and there's all these different perspectives and ways of looking into a same problem. So, so yeah, I'm with you. What Mike and I are doing with four kids, I mean, just like, because it's like a, this cumulative experience, right? They're living there, each of them, their experience as individuals, but also collectively. It seems hard, like Kerwin is saying, for people to think about it or to start thinking about planning it. It's uh, such a cool thing to do. When you are asking about this new episode of Living in Spain and what an opportunity, like if you ever think about it or plan it to live different, it's like different mini lives within like We all have the, the mm-hmm. opportunity to do that, I think. It's just a matter of taking that risk or I wouldn't call it, just stepping out of that comfort zone. And but that's really what life is about, just living those experiences. Everything else we're not going to keep. So, mm. yeah. You can fail miserably at not doing what you want to do. Right. Or you could fail at doing things you would love to do, Mm -hmm. or you could succeed at doing things you love to do. So these are all choices that we all make. I don't see the reason of uh, choosing to not take the chance. Right. Right. There's a famous John Wooden quote that uh, people who, who do nothing make no mistakes. I'm convinced that doers make mistakes. So you are going to make mistakes and you are going to live through difficulty, but if you do nothing, you, you gain nothing. So it's important to live all these experiences that you can and and discover that wherever you go, there are more things that connect us than separate us and divide us. So anyway, words of wisdom. 
<laughs> None of them mind. None of them mind. I'm, I'm good at quoting people. Yeah. So, yeah. No. It's important to do that. Not for well. tapas. Yeah. yeah. All right, I'm in. Let's go out for tapas. Okay. Guys, so, thank you so much for you, your time. Thank you, Sam. And, um, and all you've helped me with being here. You guys are awesome. Thanks. Thank Sam. you. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. So much fun. Viva España. <laughs> Adios. Hey everyone, thanks so much for listening to the Mindful Millennial Podcast. If you loved this episode, check out some of the other MindMill episodes. They're all free and available at themindmill.com and on all the major podcast platforms. Also, please, please, please take a second and leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. It's incredibly easy and it really is the best way to help the show. Stay tuned for more MindMill episodes coming down the line. I'll keep them interesting for you, I promise. Take it easy. Today's episode is sponsored by Best Self, makers of the Self Journal and other phenomenal productivity and mindfulness tools. At the start of 2017, I had New Year's goals like so many of us. However, having just turned 30, I wanted something different. I wanted to actually achieve my goals, not kick ass in January, followed by the quick decline back to where I started, which inherently feels worse than when I started. I decided writing my goals and recording my progress is the best way to stay the course. I had always wanted to journal regularly, but like many of us, the phobia of the blank page was enough to keep me kicking the can down the road. The self-journal was different, however. Unlike a traditional journal, the self-journal is a 13-week goal-oriented planner journal. It's designed to teach the user to set a tangible goal, break it down into achievable tasks, and work every day towards completion. The journal also includes areas for gratitude and reflection, plus notes and scheduling. So I took a chance. I got my journal and committed to the 13-week program. The outcome was greater than I could ever have imagined. The ironic thing was, I didn't achieve my first goals. However, what I did achieve was the ability to actually see my progress, what I was avoiding, and what to do next. I could actually give myself a grade on my work, not this pass-fail bullshit mentality we seem to judge our lives by. My productivity skyrocketed, along with my routines and overall happiness. I found myself able to focus on the moment, the present, rather than reliving the past or anxiously anticipating the future. If I thought of something, I now had a place to unload it from my mind. Fast forward a year, and I'm now on my fourth journal. What started as a scary new addition to my busy day has become one of my most useful tools. I can look back on this pivotal year of my life, see how far I've come, know where I'm at, and what lies ahead. So check it out. Join the thousands of people who have had their lives radically improved with the assistance of Best Self. Check out bestself.co for all the journal options and other amazing productivity tools. Or follow the link in the episode show notes to support the Mindful Millennial podcast. It's all available there.